Thank you, and good morning. It is an immense privilege to be here today um, for a couple of reasons. Firstly, I realize a lot of you have traveled a long way. You've chosen to be away from your businesses and from your families and come a long way to invest some time here. So I'm very privileged to have some of your time to talk to you about Dennis. And secondly, last time FIT was in London, in 2009, but I think we asked who was at FIP earlier, but who was actually here in, in London in 2009? I was, oh, we've probably got 20, 30 people who were actually in the Billingsgate market in 2009. Felix Dennis opened FIP in 2009, my old boss, mentor and friend, a publishing legend, but sadly not an immortal one. So he opened it, so it's, I'm sort of feeling that weight on my shoulders today as well. Hopefully we're going to get some slides. Wonderful. Good. So I'm going to start my presentation, even though I'm billed to talk about the future, talking about the past. And I'm sure many of us remember 2009. It was an interesting year, should we say. Um, I think many of us remember the like, terrifying economic consequences of a global recession. I've got a few other reminders here of what 2009 kind of meant. We had pretty much every stock market in the world in free fall. I think the FTSE reached a sort of a low of 3,500 in that time. For those of you who uh, got a bit bored in, your, in the presentations, you'd have pulled a phone out your pocket. It would have been an iPhone 3 rather than an iPhone 8 or an iPhone uh, 7 that you might pull out today. And had you pulled that phone out and thought, hmm, I see an opportunity here. I'm going to buy some Apple stock. I bought $1,000 worth, probably the cost of a ticket back then. You'd have had $8,500 worth of Apple stock today. Um, it's also the year that Michael Jackson died, that Barack Obama came to the presidency, and Avatar was the top billing movie. So, an interesting time. And I remember sitting in the audience. I was about three years into the job at that point. And uh, I thought I'd have a picture of him, but never mind. Um, there was a speaker, Morris Levy, who's now the chairman of Publicists. At the time, he was the CEO. He was the second biggest advertising agency in the world. Um, he said, pretty simply, you need to transform your businesses or die. He was very clear that if the economy returned, and it did, that the business wouldn't return to how it was. The other person who spoke uh, was Felix Dennis, and he had a really simple message. Um, he said, this is a fantastic opportunity for everyone in the room. And that was me, three years into the job, thinking, oh my god, we're in global recession, who knows what's going to happen. And there's Felix saying, grasp the opportunity. Uh, he was very clear on that. He said it was one of the greatest opportunities in the history of our industry, which felt counterintuitive. So, I'm three years into the job. I'm worried about the recession. I'm worried about what I'm going to have to do. And I listened to Felix and I listened to Maurice, and both of them had really interesting points. And I think that's one thing I take away straight away from, from uh, a Congress, is that you're going to get many, many different points of view today. Embrace not just one, but embrace lots of them. Because business today is not just about doing one thing amazingly. It's about doing lots of things well, and I'm going to elaborate on that. So let's talk about Dennis a little bit. So I love this graph, by the way. And anyone who works at Dennis will have had this graph shown to them many, many times. And any people who haven't worked at Dennis have probably seen this graph a few times. So why do I love it? Well, first of all, I love it because it's going in the right direction. And as a CEO, that's quite important. But secondly, let me explain the graph to you a little bit as well. So on the left-hand side, you have got turnover in millions of pounds um, and goes up to about just over a, uh, 100 at the top bar there. On the bottom axis, you've got time. You've got the last decade going back. And one thing I like about this graph and turnover in general is you can't bullshit turnover. You've all got great CFOs in your business. Um, I'm sure they can cut profit lots of different ways, particularly in the short term. But the great thing about turnover, every pound or every dollar or every cent that comes into your company is recorded. And here you can see in 2009, quite what was happening to Dennis. Not a pretty sight, was it? The turnover was down for the first time in many years. Um, so I made a pledge to myself in the audience, pretty much back then, to say, I want to get the company back to growth in, within one year. And we just about achieved that. In 2010, we grew. But most, more importantly, we've grown every year since. And that's one of my themes for today, grasping opportunity and really being front foot about growth. Again, if you work at Dennis, you'll hear me say growth, 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 and it's really important. Growth creates opportunity. It creates opportunity for your people, it creates opportunity for your company, and it creates opportunities you probably didn't know existed. So growth is really important to us, and I think that graph 
vindicates Felix's message, which was take the opportunity. This year, we were just below, probably I think 58 million in 2009. This year, I'm pretty confident we're going to report a turnover uh, between 102 and 105 million. So nearly doubling in size since the last FIP. So there's another message, and you're going to like this one, James. It's come to FIP, and you can double your turnover. <laughs> Might take eight years, but there you go. Um, so this is another graph. This really explains how that turnover growth is made up, because it's very easy for me to put a big slide. I think what you can see straight away, the bottom two bars are advertising, the green and the blue. Um, one is print, and one is digital. Now, print is still a very important part of our business. It's about 50% of our business at the moment. But I'm really proud of the fact that our advertising as a media company has grown over the period. It's actually grown. You can see the total advertising pool has grown, the green and the blue added together. You'll also see the yellow bar. That's our subscription business. Really strong business for us. It's a great business. It's very predictable. We get the cash up front. We have a direct relationship with our customers. And that has been an absolute bedrock of the business. And that's print subscriptions. So we're still big on print. Perhaps the most interesting piece of growth has happened in the last three years. You can see the purple bar. That is e-commerce. So as you can see, back in 2014, it was one or two million pounds in our business. This year, it'll be over 30 million. So there's an opportunity. In three years, our e-commerce business has grown from one or two million to 30 million. And if you want to hear more about that, it's the business of selling cars. So as a publisher, we actually sell cars. Near enough 300 a month at the moment. If you want to hear more about that, we've got Pete Wooten, who runs that business, talking later on this afternoon. So I'd recommend you drop into his session. So Mike, you wanted me to make the session a bit more interactive, didn't you? So rather than ask about uh, media questions, I'm going to ask a particle physics question. Have we any particle physicists in the audience today? That's a shame. Good. You can't then complain that what I'm saying is wrong. So my question is a simple one. Um, this was Einstein, and, and this question bothered him too. So the light that is coming off this screen reflected off me to you, the light in this room, it can be in one of two states. It can be a wave or it can be a particle. Who thinks that light is a waveform? Raise your hand now. Come on, don't be shy. Oh, someone is a particle physicist. Um, so we've got probably well, a smattering of people who think it's a wave. Who thinks it's a particle? Light's a particle, reaching little dots coming to you. Well, a bit less than half, all these shy people in the room. As the uh, esteemed colleagues here said, the great thing about this question is it is both. So light, in a brilliant example of physics, exists in two states at once. How is that possible? How can it be a particle and how can it be a wave? Um, and actually, the great thing about this is it's actually proved to be true. Very recently, in 2015, uh, this is a graph that actually demonstrates that light is both a particle and a wave. Now, apart from just drawing it away from media into, into quantum physics for a very brief moment. Why is this relevant to media? I think it has a really strong parallel to how we need to run our media companies going forward and going backwards as well. Um, we think a quantum approach, you know, Dennis is very much a quantum approach to media. And I think you'll recognize some of these different states in your businesses right now. So I think many of you operate print and digital business at the same time, which is quite challenging, isn't it? They feel they might be pulling in different directions. I think a lot of us are under pressure. You've already heard it several times. The word innovation, experimentation, a lot, of, a lot of pressure to do new things. There's also a huge amount of pressure on cost, a huge amount of pressure to do things quicker, faster, more efficiently. Again, they feel like they're in conflict. We're told to be more collaborative. You know, as an organization, we use Slack and Google Apps across our entire organization to be more collaborative. But we're also told individual boldness and personal achievement is important. We're told to be really focused on quality, focused on make, producing a great magazine, but we're also told to diversify our revenues. And actually, this is specifically a Dennis issue. We like to think of ourselves as a very commercially aggressive organization, yet we're owned by a charity. So again, they feel like there could be a clash there. So these are all sort of quantum problems. And we took these problems and said to the company, well, tell us what you think Dennis's values are. You you tell me what you think Dennis stands for. So we literally did an exercise. We got the company up, not all at once, but in groups, and got them to put post-its on a wall. And those post-its had some values on them, like innovative or uh, professional or fun. And we started to realize quite quickly these things were in, were in conflict, but actually really brilliantly different when combined. So we are very proud of the fact that as a company, we are highly efficient. Um, and 
We pride ourselves on innovation. I'm going to talk more about that later. Now, we're not the only company doing this. Again, I'm going to refer back to Apple. I'm sure many of you own some form of iOS device or a MacBook. Um, Apple. I think most people agree Apple is regarded as an innovative, experimental company. It produces great devices through innovation. What people don't necessarily know is Apple is also, by a long way, the most efficient company, tech manufacturer in the world. It has the best R&D to uh, product ratio. It has the best supply chain, the best manufacturing rates. That's actually what Cook brought to, Tim Cook brought to Apple. He brought efficiency to the supply chain and manufacturing. So it's that combination of brutal efficiency but high innovation. And actually, the great thing about efficiency gives you more time and money to spend on innovation. The other uh, values that came up with is a business for very long term. We're unusual and we're owned by a charity. This charity plants trees. And trees take roughly 100 years to grow <laughs> to full size. So you've got this weird situation. We've got a highly agile media company owned by this charity with a very long term, -term purpose. But we feel, again, that's a really lovely quantum state to be in, both agile and long term in our thinking at once. Uh, as a company, and again, I can say this, but it's more how you act. Uh, we like to have a bit of fun. Uh, probably that's sort of Felix's DNA is still, still in our blood. We like to actually have a bit of fun as a company, uh, to, to play hard. But also, professionalism is hugely, hugely important to us, to our customers, to our clients. When someone rings us, we ring them back. When we say we're going to do something, we do something. Professionalism and how we present ourselves is hugely important. And the last point is, as I mentioned, we are highly collaborative as a company, and I'm sure many of you work on projects where more than 50 people are involved on a partnership project, for instance, where people from all around the organization, possibly even different countries, have to work on a, sin a single project. So we're highly collaborative, but we celebrate individual boldness very, very strongly. And this is kind of backed up by the number of awards some of our employees have won over the last few years, and I'm immensely proud of that. So I think these... These quantum states are quite important in our business. The idea that you can't just do one thing, you've got to do multiple things and do them well. But be comfortable with the fact that they coexist. So I'm going to talk quickly about innovation, because it's really, I talked about growth being important, and innovation is important. And I mentioned the opportunity that would bring. But there's also a really strong financial imperative to innovation. And to measure this, I went back to 2009. It's kind of the theme of today a bit for me and looked at some of the brands in the company. So these, these at the moment are my top, and I haven't put them in order for, for the competitors in the audience. They are uh, a top 10 brands by profitability in Dennis Publishing in our portfolio as we speak. And the financial imperative to me was, if in 2009, if I produced that list, only three of those brands would be on it. Seven of them did not exist in the company eight years ago. And that makes me think, well, we hadn't innovated and grown and done new stuff. What would the company look like? And I'm pretty sure that red graph at the beginning wouldn't look quite so pretty. So the speed of change, the requirement for new product, the requirement for innovation is absolutely key. And I would also caution you against thinking innovation just means product. Innovation can mean a whole load of different things in your business. It can mean producing a magazine more efficiently, investing in technology to make you more productive, just thinking about doing things in a different way, that efficiency piece is really important. So again, I think if you ask your teams, what does innovation mean, they come back with new product. Sometimes it's worth pushing them towards, okay, how could you do things differently to make it more efficient? But I'm going to talk again a little bit about the process for launch specifically, and I'm going to give a shout out for um, Karen O'Connor, who's speaking uh, in the specialist room after me, um, about the Week Junior, which absolutely embraced this progress, uh, process. And that was a print launch. So when we launch a product at Dennis, I have two simple questions that I ask. And you'd be absolutely staggered how many of these launch ideas don't even make the first grade. And the reason I've got this wave of information hitting this, this green person is exactly what the world feels like. We are inundated with media. So if someone comes to, to the board or to me or to anyone in the, uh, the organization with a launch idea, I'm hoping they're going to ask this first question. Is there a gap in this busy media schedule, in this tsunami of information for your product, for your information, for your content? Quite often there isn't. Quite often it can be a Me Too product. Or when you look, there's six or seven things doing this already. It's really, really important. You need to have a reason to exist uh, in a modern media world. So, okay, you passed that. You've got, you found a gap in the market. And with the Week Junior, that gap just came about by listening to what children had to say. That they hadn't, 
they required uh, a grown-up and informative news magazine. It just didn't really exist, or there was one in the market at the time. So the next thing you do is say, okay, how do we make money from this? Now, this is a Felix instilled quality in me. <laughs> the first question he would ask, he'd turn them around and say, okay, how do we make money from this, James? And I think this is really, really important. Again, you can forget that. Let's build this fantastic audience. Okay, but how do we make money from it? Where's the business model? And that business model really can be print. Don't just think it's digital. It can be e-commerce. You think about the markets you operate in and then think about the business model. And actually, what it stops is what quite often happens is people start with these other questions here, these other points. Oh, let's think about the platform. Let's build something for mobile. Why? Why not build something for your customers who use mobile? What's the investment required? What resource do we need? They're questions that have to come after these. But often people start there. And it's very dangerous because the idea takes shape without answering those two basic premises. And once you've made your decision, it's passed those two goals, um, I think it's quite simple from then on. There's just three points. Uh, just get on with it. Don't hesitate. Don't be paralyzed by an analysis paralysis. Just set your goals. I think really important is iterate furiously. So come up with a product and change it, and change it again, and change, and change, and change. Don't be afraid of iterating it. You can't, it's not, again, thinking back to sort of 2009, the idea when you spent 10 months working on a launch and launched this rocket into the media stratosphere it just doesn't work anymore. You have to change your product and iterate very, very quickly. And this last point, let it go, it actually applies two ways. First of all, it applies to, you know, just release it into the ecosystem sometimes. Again, with product launches we've done, we've launched them where they're not quite ready. That's okay. Your customers will tell you what they think pretty damn quick. And the other point is a leader. Quite often you need to let it go. You employ great talent in your business, and it's so tempting, isn't it, with launch projects, because they're new and exciting to get really fingers all over it and find out what's going on. Don't. Keep your nose in, by all means, but keep your fingers out, is my sort of motto on that. Let it go. Let the talent do it. You'll get a better result. Which kind of brings me on to my last point. It's a point not often raised, actually, but I think it's really, really important. We all are told to transform our businesses, to start change, to engineer change, to, to welcome change, diversify, innovate. But how much do we actually change ourselves? And I think this is a great cartoon. I really like it because it kind of sums up how I sometimes feel, and I'm sure some of us in the room sometimes feel, about change, that everyone wants it, don't they? Uh, not that many people actually want to undertake a change process, and there are very, very few who want to lead the change. And I'm really glad all of you are here today because I'm assuming that's part of the role, is leading that change. And then you think about these values, uh, and they're not all the most flattering values, but I kind of quite like this, uh, this grid here because you've got different leadership styles, and I definitely see bits of me in here. Uh, and I think the key is, again, it's a bit like a quantum value. You can't just be one style of leader anymore. You need to be able to move through the gears. You need to be sometimes a visionary when you're talking about something really far future. Sometimes you need to be a really strict operator, that efficiency point. You need to be a coach but you need to move through those gears. You can't just be one type of leader anymore. And I think that's a really key point for me, that leadership, in other words, you in this room, you are responsible for change in your organization, but you are the leader of it. But how much time do you spend on yourself? Um, these first three points I have pinched from a very clever lady who did a talk on a TED talk. Her name's Rosalinda Torres. I'm going to tweet it rather than go through it now after the event, the link. But she worked for the Boston Consultancy Group, and she did a piece of research on 4,000 high-performing companies in the world. And she identified these three first three points as defining of the success of those companies or those leaders. And actually, the great thing about a Congress is you're ticking one of some of those boxes already. The first successful quality was, how many, as a leader, how much time do you spend on your business rather than in it? In other words, sleeves rolled up, managing spreadsheets, managing, micromanaging. How much time do you spend stepping away thinking about reflecting on your business. The fact you're all here today is a great start, so well done. Because you are spending time reflecting, thinking about your business, thinking on your business. The second point, again, a real danger point, is having a diverse network. It's so easy just to talk to the same people, to the same um, set of friends, to the same nationalities, the same industries. Very, very dangerous, because you're kind of looking at the world through a letterbox. Don't do that. Take the opportunity, I mean, it's a fabulous opportunity, Congress, FIP Congress, because you've got so many diverse nationalities here. 
Go out of your comfort zone. Take the time to diversify your network. You will learn something new. You will be challenged in ways you haven't thought about. And the last one is perhaps the most difficult one, and I find this personally quite difficult. It's been quite a personal journey for me. To be successful, you have to abandon a practice that worked for you in the past. So things that you think, you might have heard yourself in meetings to your leadership team saying, yes, but last time we did that, we just did this and it worked. That's no good. You've got to be able to abandon those practices to change. So that is my sort of challenge to you as a leader. Are you investing in yourselves as leaders? Because how can you expect change in your organization if you are not changing yourself? So are you coaching? Are you being coached? Are you training? Are you spending time reflecting on your skills and improving them? That is really, really important. And certainly I feel, had I been the leader I was eight years ago and not invested in this area and not made mistakes, not learned from those mistakes and invested, I simply couldn't have done the job that Dennis has done over the last eight years. There was a picture of Felix there, so you can have to imagine him. He's kind of looking down on us. This was Felix's quote, right, at the end of the FIP in 2009. Um, pretty safe quote, wasn't it? Clever old bugger. He kind of knew he wasn't going to go wrong here. What he basically was saying, that in 10 years' time, we we're going to get together in London. Well, he was a year and a half out. And <laughs> we gathered in a, in a venue, telling each other stories, lies, and selling uh, and bargaining. Well, that was a pretty safe bet that he was going to get more of it. Um, my takeaway is a bit more challenging, I would say. Coming out of recession in 2009, a lot of people in this room, and there were a few of you who put their hands up, felt genuinely terrified. This was going to be catastrophic. Do you know? You can see the story I've told. It isn't. It wasn't. It isn't going to be. You've really got to be aware to grasp the opportunity. You've got to be flexible in your leadership style. And most importantly, don't forget, if you want to make organizational change, the change has to start with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, James. Thank you. Thank you.